huge mountains and their towering slopes remain standing firm against the forces of nature what internal strength allows them to withstand these natural forces this internal strength is a property of the soil known as shear strength we explored shear strength and how it is described by the mohr coulomb theory in our previous video in short shear strength is the ability of the soil to resist the forces that tend to cause sliding along its internal layer and that shear strength of the soil is given by mohr coulomb theory as this where tau dash is the shear stress at failure sigma dash is the effective normal stress c is the effective cohesion between the particles and phi is the effective angle of shearing resistance there are numerous ways to determine the shear strength of the soil in this video we will dive into one of the most simple and widely used methods the direct shear test The direct shear test is considered one of the most common and straightforward methods to determine the shear strength of the soil. It is a laboratory test where using machinery the soil sample is literally sheared across its width splitting it into the two halves along a horizontal plane in the middle. This helps us determine the soil's shear strength. For the test the soil specimen is placed inside a shear box this box is typically made of brass or gun metal and can be either square or circular in shape a common size for the square box is 60 by 60 by 50 in mm the box comes with grid plates these are plain for undrained tests and perforated for drain tests it should be mentioned here that during the test the soil is compressed and in the process water tries to leave the sample we can either allow the water to escape or drain out of the sample which is called drain test or we can prevent the water from escaping which is called undrain test in the setup of a drain test porous stones are placed at the top and the bottom of the soil sample these stones help water to drain out to apply the normal load to the sample from the top a pressure pad is fitted into the box the lower half of the box is securely fixed to a base plate which is held firmly in place with a larger container this container is supported on rollers allowing it to be pushed forward at a constant rate by a geared jack This setup acts as strain control device. A strain control device applies deformation at a constant rate. So the soil sample is sheared at a consistent speed throughout the test. These devices offer high precision and control, making sure the test results are accurate and repeatable. We track the shear displacement with a dial gauge fitted to the container. To measure the shear force on the soil sample, a proving ring is attached to the system. The upper part of the shear box is lifted to create a small gap between the two halves. The size of this gap depends on the maximum particle size in the soil. It's usually kept at about 1 mm. Now we are ready to start the testing. First, we apply a normal load to the sample. to create a normal stress of 25 kN per meter square then we apply a shear load at a constant strain rate the sample begins to shear along the horizontal plane between the two halves due to generated forces within the sample we observe the changes in the readings of the proving ring and the dial gauges these readings are taken every 30 seconds the test continues until the specimen fails or reaches 20% longitudinal displacement 
whichever occurs first. The failure occurs when the proving ring's readings begin to decrease after reaching a peak. However, there are some soils for which we don't observe such peak. For such soils, we assume that failure has occurred when shearing strain of 20% is reached. At the end of the test, we remove the sample from the box and determine its water content. We then repeat the test under different normal stresses of 50, 100, 200 and 400 kilonewton per meter square. The range of these stresses should cover the typical loading conditions of the field problem we are studying, so we can accurately determine the shear parameters needed. Before we dive into the results, it's worth mentioning that this test can be performed under any of the three conditions that a soil sample can be tested in. These conditions are UU, CU and CD. UU is unconsolidated undrained condition where the sample is not allowed to consolidate or compress and also water is not allowed to escape during shear process. Then consolidated undrained condition where the sample is allowed to consolidate under the normal stress but water is not allowed to escape during the shear process. Then consolidated drained condition where the sample is allowed to consolidate and water is allowed to escape during the shear. Now we begin our calculations with the results of the test. We create a plot of shear stress against shear strain. To do this, we calculate the shear stress at any point during the test by dividing the shear load indicated by the proving ring by the cross-sectional area of the sample. Then. We find the shear strain at a particular load by dividing the shear displacement delta H that is the amount of the soil sample moves horizontally during the test by the initial length of the soil sample in the direction of this movement capital N. Using the data we plot stress strain curve. For dense ends we observe this kind of graph where shear stress reaches a peak at a small strain. This means the soil can handle a high amount of force in the beginning. But as the strain keeps increasing, the shear stress decreases slightly and becomes more or less constant, known as ultimate stress. This ultimate stress is important for long-term stability. In case of loose ends, Shear stress increases gradually and then attains a constant value, known as the ultimate stress or residual strength. Interestingly, it's been observed that the ultimate shear stress for both dense and loose ends when tested under similar conditions is roughly the same. We have already seen that the failure of the sample is considered when stress in soil reaches at peak or for some soils which never reaches peak, it is 20% of shearing strain. With the data obtained from multiple specimens, we determine the shear stress required to cause failure for each normal stress. We then plot all these points on a graph of shear stress versus normal stress. By connecting these points with a straight line, we get what is called the failure envelope. The angle of this envelope from the horizontal gives us the angle of shearing resistance and its intercept on the vertical axis is equal to the cohesion intercept C. Any point representing a combination of normal stress and shear stress that lies below failure plane indicates a safe condition for the soil. On the other hand, any point above this line represents a condition where the soil has already failed. The direct shear test is very easy to perform. However, it does have some limitations. One is that when sample is sheared, the stress 
isn't evenly distributed across the failure plane. Instead, the stresses are higher around the edges which can cause the soil to fail gradually, almost like how a piece of paper tears. Because of this, the soil's full strength isn't fully utilized all at once across the entire failure plane. Another limitation is that the area under shear gradually decreases as the test progresses. Determining the exact corrected area is challenging. So we typically use the original area for calculating stresses. However, if we do use the corrected area for a more accurate measure of shear stress, the formula is this where A0 is the initial area of a specimen and delta is the displacement. Another limitation of this test is that we cannot measure the pore water pressure during the test. This is important because pore water pressure affects the effective stress in the soil, which is the stress actually carried by the soil particles. Another limitation is that the orientation of the failure plane is fixed. It's always horizontal. This might not be the weakest plane in the soil. In real world conditions, the soil could fail along a different plane that is actually the weakest. So the test might not show the true failure behavior of the soil. To address these limitations, the triaxial test was developed. This test provides a more comprehensive understanding of the soil behavior. We will look into it in our next video. I would like to thank my patron for supporting elementary engineering financially. Also, if you think elementary engineering has given you knowledge that worth something to you, consider supporting this channel on patron and get access to the questions and their solutions related to various topics of soil mechanics. Your support will help me continue creating more such valuable content. If that doesn't resonate with you, spreading a word about elementary engineering will also be of great help. Only your love and support keeps elementary engineering going. You can find the links of books and other sources I referred for the creation of this video in the description. Read direct shear test at elementaryengineeringlibrary.com. All the links are in the description. Thank you.